Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, yes, yes. I wasn't even paying attention. I was just on Twitter. I was on Twitter trying to retweet that we were about to go live. Welcome back to another edition, another episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Look at this. I'm in my camouflage gear. I'm in my camouflage gear out here. Day two is due to start. What well, is coming up to minutes to 10? Two, three, four, what, what minute? 11, 12, 1, 2, 5 hours. Blood, come on. Uh, no, wait, wait, what's 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 6 hours. Day 2 is due to start in 6 hours' time, which means I need to be in my bed in about half an hour's time so I can wake up five and a half hours from now to lock in for day 2. My name is Rachel St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you. Welcome to the live show. It's a little quick one. It's a little quick recap of what happened on day 1. We must celebrate, yes? Of course, we must celebrate West Indies 266 for eight at the close of day one. And I'm sure some of you are going to be like, oh, what, but what about this man? And what about that man? And let's criticize this and let's criticize that. But you, you know what? You know where I'm going to start? You know, where I'm going to start on this one. Let's break bread. Let's break bread first. Before this test series began, what were your realistic goals? as to what West Indies could achieve with this weakened squad, right? Now, on, on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast Twitter channel, or Twitter handle, at Caribbean Cricket, for those who don't know, I said that what I wanted to see by the end of this series, I said I wanted one West Indian to score a century. And I'm talking realistic. I'm not talking about pipe dream stuff. I'm talking about realistic. <laughs> Fireball, i just seen your comment. <laughs> All right. uh, anyway, um, I said, um, realistic, I said, one century from one man, because that was realistic that we might get one man scoring a century. I said, one of the newcomers must score over 60. I didn't expect two of them, but I thought one newcomer must score over 60, and that would be positive. I said that we should be able to bowl Australia out for something under 500 runs. That was the third one. And what was the fourth one? I think I said we must make Australia back twice in the series. So we've already done that. We've already made Australia back twice. We've already bowled Australia out and bowled them out for actually something competitive, which happened in the first test. In this test, Kevem Hodge on test match, um, one of the test match debutants in on this series, made a 71. So he's got my over 60 score. The only thing that hasn't happened is that we haven't had a West Indian score a century. And we're probably unlikely to see that now. I don't see this team being able to bat significantly well the second time round. I could be wrong, but I think it's probably unlikely. So I think before we get into the kind of minutiae of who did well, who did bad, who's down bad, who should be criticised, everyone has to be realistic about what they legitimately thought this side could do. And I think once you're realistic about what this side could do based on the fact that Athenais was only two test matches in, Mackenzie was one test match in, Graves was on debut, Hodge was on debut, Tej has only played eight test matches. Once you factor that our numbers two to six were basically super inexperienced against the World Test Champions in their backyard against a, a GOAT bowling attack where all four bowlers are in the top 10 bowlers in the world, I think they've done all right. I think they've done all right. And we can criticise and no one's above any criticism, but we can criticise and we can criticise. But fundamentally, I don't think many West Indian fans realistically thought that this side would be capable of getting 266 in any innings against Australia, given the, the level of inexperience and frankly, given the level of ability of the players um, in, their, in, in their careers to date domestically. So big up the West Indies. We got the West Indies. Don't get me wrong. We can get into it. We can chop it up. We can chop it up and say, what about this man and this man's down bad and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, 
big up the West Indies. You, you you've made a you've made some you made us proud. You showed fight, and actually, um, I saw a t uh, saw a tweet where it said this was the first um, test match this summer. Because remember, for the Australians, remember the Australians played three against Pakistan, and this is their second against us. It was the first test match of the summer where Australia were in the field for the whole day. Again, that's no mean feat. Uh, when you're a limited, limited side, you have to look at incremental improvements. You have to look at green shoots of hope, which suggests that the side is battling. Before I start and before I get into the comments, I also want to just find this tweet um, that I sent earlier today. If you're in the Discord group, you already know it. But I just want to repeat it again because this is my mantra about West Indies cricket. Because I got, I got, I'm, got I'm not going to lie. I got a bit frustrated earlier on today, uh, probably because I was tired and I was down bad and it was like 4.30 in the morning or 4.45 in the morning and West Indies were already collapsing and I was just sitting on my couch down bad and tired, right? But man were just, man were just in the comments and man were tweeting going, ah, oh, Craig and Tage need to bat quicker than this. We need an opener with intent. And I shouldn't have bit. I shouldn't have bit, but I bit. And the point I was making to people is we have an identity. Don't don't get don't get it twisted. Just because England backed this baseball figure and back quick, don't get it twisted that we can do the same thing. And don't get it. I'm not I'm not saying that Tage and Craig are um beyond criticism, but the criticism has to be constructive, right? And my whole point about Tage and Craig is. Even if you think Tej is out of, out of Nick, even if you think Craig is out of Nick and so on and so forth, it's very simple for me. And everybody in the comments right now, here's your first task. Name someone in domestic cricket better at opening the innings than Tej and Craig. When John, John Campbell was the previous opener before Tej, right? And John Campbell used to go at a strike rate of 60 plus. He'd get to about 20 odd, then get out. And you lot, you same lot who are in the chat right now, would cuss John Campbell out from here to thine kingdom come, saying he's too reckless, he's too loose, he gives his wicket away, so on and so forth. John obviously got the, the drugs whereabout violation and Tage came in. Tage can't bat very quickly. Craig has never really batted quickly, right? When Craig and Tage come off, they lay a foundation. Now, obviously, some of you are going to say, but Mash, they aren't coming off. I hear that. So name someone better then. Um, don't worry, I'll wait. Don't, in fact, let me pause. Name someone better. And don't just don't just give me a random name. Give me statistical evidence that suggests they're better than Craig and Tej. I'm going to pause now and wait. You lot who think you know what you're talking about, name someone better right now who can open in West Indies cricket, who is available, doesn't want to play T20 cricket, that is better than them two. Let me drink my juice whilst I wait. I'm still waiting. Don't worry, I'm waiting. Don't worry, I'll wait. I'm waiting, you know. Looking in the comments, I'm waiting. Come on, people, name someone better. Tell me which of your down bad countrymen can come in instead, because that's what you are on, it's the insularity thing. Tell me which of your down bad island men can come in to replace them. Give me someone, please. I'm still waiting. Anyone? Man are saying Kieran Powell. You men are drinking stale Morby out here, man. So, anyways, you get the point I'm trying to make here. Um, and what I wanted to go to, I had a point to go to from here. Right, yeah, so what I wrote on Twitter earlier today was as follows, okay? Um, if anybody's in the, the any, if anyone's in the live that's in, like, the Discord group, actually, let me see if I can copy and paste it. I said this was going to be a quick one. Now you lot have got me started, but trust me, I'm going to bed by half past ten. Um, let me let me put it in the uh, in the dis in the in the chat, right? Right. So for those of you who are following on in the chat, did it? Right. I don't know if it's po if, it, if it's posted all of it, but I'll read it to you now. I tweeted this um, earlier today, what uh, in session one, uh, like probably one hour into play. I'll read it to you for those following in the chat. My attitude to grind ball because that's what I think West Indies play is very simple. One, 
West Indies are a very, very limited test match side, right? We're near the bottom. We're probably like six or seven, right? Because we're so limited, we have to play to our, we have to accentuate our positives and hide our negatives. When you consider what the West Indies positives are as a test match side, it's our ability to just grind, just grind and try and stay in the match. For those of you who need a football analogy, it is like a team going to Manchester City in the Premier League and knowing that they can't go toe to toe. They can't fight fire with fire. So the only thing they can do is grind, grind and try to stay in the match and wait for that set piece chance. For those who need a football analogy, right? OK, cool. So if you then accept that, that that's the only real positive we've got when it comes to the bat, right? You then have to accept that the whole emphasis behind grind ball or how I um, kind of analyze it from when Phil Simmons was coached to now with Andre Coley being coach is grind ball is our best chance at staying in a match, at, be, at finding a way to just be in the match, at elongating the match, at taking the match deep, right? Once we can begin to take the match deep, then you can begin to play some element or some method of positive cricket. Whether you man think that positive cricket means hitting fours and sixes, or whether you man think that positive cricket means rotating the strike on a more regular basis, we are limited and can only begin to do that once we've taken the game deep enough where it's just still in the game. If you lot want us to play a more expansive version of test match cricket, we need to change the players we are selecting. The, the, the players who are in this test match side, from Josh to Kavem to Craig to Tej to Bonner, when he was in that side, they are grind ball cricketers. If you want there to be, if you want them to play a different style of cricket, then you pick a team full of Kurt McKenzie's. But understand that if you pick a team full of Kurt McKenzie's, you're going to get a dash in 20 like a John Campbell, you'll get a dash in 20, a dash in 25, and man might give it away. Man might then give it away. So you have to work out, as a West Indian fan base, we have to work out what is the best approach for our side, given the limitations of our side. For me, that's grind ball. For some of you, it frustrates you because it's because it's boring, it's it's dry, and man ain't scoring off balls, and they're going slow. Guess what, people? It's called Test Match Cricket. We ain't trying to win this match in one day. We ain't trying to win this match in two days. We're trying to stay in the match, first and foremost, to give us a chance to maybe win or draw the match. If you lot don't understand what I'm saying, go back to what happened in the England series in 2022. First Test Match, second Test Match. We grinded our way through to draws, kept ourselves in the series. Third test match in Grenada, Carl Mayers did what he did, won the test match. It's called test match cricket, people. It's called test match cricket. And don't get me wrong, it's, is it hella frustrating when Craig and Tej go slow and then nick off and they've been there for like, I don't know, 35 balls and only scored six? Yeah. But we also have to play percentages. We have to know that when it does come off, it's worth what they're doing because we're in the game. The game's gone deeper. The last test match we played uh, before this Australia series was India at home. For those who don't remember, that test match was a draw, right? Look at this Tabo fool. Tabo saying England were terrible then, Mash. Tabo, England was still a better side than us, statistically, rankings wise they were still a better side than us so i don't want to hear about england were terrible man beat england that's all you need to know you may love to come with excuses when west indies win matches anyways the point is when we drew against india yes the rain came but if you go and study that um that second innings against india um tej lasted if i'm someone go find the scorecard for me but if i'm not mistaken tej made 26 off about 97 balls we knew the rain was coming but you lot you lot should know as well as i know when one west indian wicket falls a next six wickets can fall in double quick time as well and tej grinded it out until the rain came that's why we need grind ball cricketers we when you're limited you have to play a certain kind of way 
You just have to play a certain kind of way. I'm not saying you must agree with me. I'm just saying that this is what we got. This is what we got to work with. Okay. Anyways, let's get into the test match. Let's get into the test match. So obviously we were what sixty something for five. Um, the one thing I would say about West Indies being sixty something for five is that I I don't think even with the new ball moving and it did move a bit in the first session. I'm just thinking back to the dismissals. Who genuinely got an unplayable delivery? Craig nicked off outside off stump on what? I know like Hazel would drew, like drew him out, but Craig could have left that, right? And normally you'd expect Craig to leave that. So Craig didn't get one. Tej went hard hands at one, probably could have left that again. It was on the fifth stump line. I can't remember if it was Stark who was uh, the bowler. Tej could have left that. For all of the, the kind of dashing stroke play from McKenzie to get to 21, his dismissal was probably the most dunce dismissal out of all of them. Ball was high, ball was wide, man chased it, just gave the wicket away. He could have left that. Athenaise went after a wide one on the sixth stump line. He could have left that. Graves, how did... Now, I thought Graves, I think, actually got a... Graves got one that held its line a touch and slightly moved away from him. I think you could argue that Graves' dismissal was a goodish delivery. So of the top six, I reckon four of the top six got, got themselves out. Not gave it away per se, but just got themselves out to deliveries that certainly didn't need to be played at. I thought Graves' delivery, yeah, I thought he got a good one. OK, so at, in that 64 for five situation, four of those five wickets were unnecessary. So to me, it's not about it's not about grind ball. It's not about playing quicker. I think when you look back and extrapolate and certainly for those of you who weren't awake this morning or whatever time in your time zone, when you go back and look at it. The, 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 the dismissals were were. Um, self there were, there were there were errors in our in our battership we enforced errors right self enforced errors from ourselves right it wasn't down to magnificent australian bowling they did bowl they i mean the australians did bowl some good balls but those weren't the ones that got the wickets did we have to ride our luck yes so at 64 for 5 probably some of you who stayed awake probably went to bed by the time it was 64 for 5 in the uk i was getting ready for work so in a weird way, although these test matches start at 4 a.m. Uh, UK time, by the time they're getting into its proper piece, piece, we're actually waking up and we're all getting up, ready to go do our thing at work. So for a lot of us, we are at, it probably actually works a bit um, to watch it in the UK. So um, I stayed awake by default because I, I was I was getting ready for work. I was going to make my way into work and so on and so forth. So then we got into the Josh and Kavem partnership. Now, I don't, obviously, the partnership, I think, was 146, maybe 147 runs. Do you know what I loved about that partnership beyond the fact it was a 147-run partnership? And I think it's the best partnership in Australia by, an, by a travelling side in quite some time, right? Josh and Kabim didn't do anything more for me than play within their limitations. And that's what I would suggest for all West Indian batters. And in, in, in the past, when Craig has been excellent for the West Indies, it's because he is the kind of blueprint to all of the other West Indian batters about how you play within your limitations. Not, not trying to invent shots, not trying to play streaky shots, but doing what you can do and recognising that that's all you can do. Nudge, nerdle, into the gaps of one. Put away the occasional bad ball that you get. Strong defence. I think fundamentally, as much as people want to say, oh, they 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 batted with intent. First and foremost, what Josh and Kavem did is they played with a strong defence. Again, for me, it goes back to grind ball. That 140-something partnership they put together was done at a strike rate of 2.81 per over. They They weren't dashing. They weren't dashing. They played every single ball on merit. Where they got beaten, they just accepted it, brushed it off, and went back to playing every single ball on its merit again. 
So it was an example to the rest of the team about how to go about your work and how to go about your business. Was it unfortunate that Josh obviously fell 21 short of his uh, century, 79? Uh, what did what did Kavem get? 71, okay? Let's talk on Josh. It's going to be funny. Let's talk on Josh. I think a lot of you, if you're long-time followers of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, you know how I feel about Josh De Silva already. I think that I think that some of you, and it's all it also extends to the media, have I think there is a higher expectation put on Josh De Silva than is reasonable. That's what I think. I th for, I'm not going to go down the usual line of argument that I go down here. I'm, I'm actually just going to keep it simple like that. I think we expect more from Josh than is reasonable. Is Josh talented? Of course he is. I don't think there's anyone in the Caribbean who watches Josh play and wouldn't be able to work out that he is a talented bat. If Josh wasn't a wicketkeeper, I think we should all accept that he should probably be batting in the top six because he has the defensive game to suggest that he is a top six batter. Uh, being a top six batter for me starts with, do you have a good defence? After Craig and Tej, when Tej is on form, Josh has the next best defence in the team, right? Um, so he should really and truly be a top six bat. The problem for Josh is we don't have another wicketkeeper bat. I'm not counting Imlac. Imlac. Imlac ain't ready for all of this, right? Um, Jamal Hamilton is mid-30s. He clearly isn't being considered. Shane Dowrich is suing West Indies cricket. He's obviously retired. He's not considered. Shea Hope um, doesn't want to keep doesn't want to keep in Test match cricket for, for for a long time, right? So when you break it down, who else is there to really challenge Josh De Silva? And the one thing I would say. And this is where, where I'm slightly critical of Josh. Josh isn't under any pressure. Josh isn't under any pressure. Every single batter, and forget actually, forget cricket, any sports person needs pressure. They need to know that their place ain't guaranteed. Unless they're like a generational talent, like a LeBron James in basketball, where their pressure is themselves and their own high standards, on a West Indian level, every single one of these batters, bowlers, whatever, need pressure. Josh ain't under any pressure. You see this 77 that Josh has made? His spot is now secure in the West Indies team for the next year. Ain't no one challenging Josh De Silva's spot now after that 77. And that shouldn't be the case, but that is the case. The other thing I want to say about Josh is this. When you lot are saying that Josh should be doing this and Josh should be doing that, What's who are you comparing him to? Who are you comparing him to that's done any better than him? Dennis Ramdin averaged 25 for the West Indies team, and I liked Dennis Ramdin, but Jen Dennis ad averaged, averaged 25. Excellent glove, man, but Dennis averaged 25. Who are these great wicket keepers that we've had in our down bad era where you're like, that's what Josh De Silva should be doing? What did Ridley Jacobs average? What 27? Who are these men? Shane Dowrich, what did he average by the time he finished? What, 20, 29, 28? So who are these Who are these men that you are thinking that Josh De Silva, what are the, who, who's he supposed to be, what's he supposed to be doing that's better than all the men that came before him and, and all the men that are waiting in regional cricket? I just need to know. I just need to know. Right now, Josh De Silva's test match average stands at 27. What, what is it that he's supposed to be doing? Because God knows when he fails, you men are quick to say, oh, he's not good enough. He's not good enough. So what's he supposed to be doing? I, I, I need to know, you know. I need to know. I'm not saying he's above criticism. I'm just saying let's keep this in perspective. Let's keep this one in perspective. We can't go too high. We can't go too low. Let's always put the context and let's keep it in perspective. Mm, let me drink some juice. 391 people in the live. I didn't even realize. I hope there's um 391 likes by the time I by the time I log this one off. Let me go put my Black Panther mask on. Chop up a couple, man. Anyway, <laughs> oh so, um, anyways, Kabem Hodge. Let's get to Kabem. 
Um, yeah, I enjoyed Kabem's innings. I think it was gritty. Um, I think he showed a lot of heart. Um, I think there's a, obviously there's a lot being said. If there's any Dominicans in the chat who pay um, close attention to um, to to domestic cricket and Kabem's career, Kabem is unfortunate, and I've said this before on previous live shows and on um, on previous live shows and 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 recorded shows and so on and so forth. For those who forget, Kabem Hodge was called up to that Bangladesh tour in 2021 when a lot of the senior guys said they're not traveling. Kabem went on that tour, didn't play. I've long believed that Kabem should have debuted for the West Indies long before this, not because he's super talented, but just because I think he's somebody who on the domestic scene has put his hand up. I think people will look at his overall average of 28 and be like, well, obviously he's no good, right? But let me just, um, I should have had this ready before we started. Oh my God. Uh, wait a minute, people. I just want to read out some stats to you, which are quite important to understand the context of why Kavem deserves to be here. I'm not saying he's the best. Uh, I'm not saying that um, he's going to be super great from here on in, but there's definitely some stuff you, I need to read out to you. I can't even find the damn thing. Um, I might have to, to give up on finding this one. Can I find it? All I'm getting is cricket. West. You know what? You know what, people? I might have to, I'll have to just put this one. There we go. Found it. Right. Okay. So, Kavem Hodge, if I just read something out to you, like, here we go. So, I hope it's. I hope my point I'm about to make to you makes sense now. I'm about to embarrass myself. So, this year's the last West Indies Championship. Obviously, we've not played a lot of matches. Kevin played five matches in the West Indies uh, four day championship, ten innings, and averaged thirty nine one hundred two fifties. Before that, in the Super Fifty, not the last one, the one before that. He played six matches in Super 50. I know Super I know Super 50 is white ball. I know it's not red ball, but it's just bears mentioning, right? He averaged 52 across six matches with 100. The Super uh, the, the Red Bull Championship before that in 2021, 2022, he had a lean one. But if you go to the 2019, 2020 uh, Red Bull Championship, which was which is what that Bangladesh tour was selected off the back of. You know, that one where Bonner got called up, Mayers got called up, Josh got called up, Kavem got called up as well. And in that season, Kavem had scored, uh, sorry, Kavem had played eight uh, first class matches, averaged 38 with 104 50s. So when you look at Kavem's last three Red Bull Championship seasons, he's played effectively, if I add them all up, he's played 18 matches. Um, and in those 18 matches, he scored 200s and 650s. No, sorry, uh, 750s. 200s and 750s in his last 18 first-class matches in the Caribbean. I'm not saying that's amazing. Of course I'm not. But by domestic West Indian standards, man deserves his spot. If you think I'm wrong, tell me in the chat. But by our weak domestic standards... His overall average of 28 looks poor, but it doesn't really play out in the context of his form since about 2020. His form has risen and he's in the team on the on merit based off that form. Obviously, he played in that West Indies tour, um, a tour of South Africa and averaged 30 on that West Indies, West Indies a tour of South Africa as well, with 150 in those uh, three unofficial test matches as well. And this is before we talk about um, his quite useful left arm darts, which he's not had to bowl yet um, on this tour. So big up Kavem. Give up, big up Kavem. Is he is he perfect? No. Is he the long term answer? Possibly, probably not. Does he deserve his chance? Yes. Will he go to England now? Yes, and deservedly so. That seventy one guarantees that he should go to England. And if there's one of the established players who chose not to come to Australia, so whether that's Brandon King, whether that's Shea Hope, whether that's even a Jason Holder, if one of them established people who said, actually, I'm not coming to Australia, Carl Mayers is another one. If they don't get picked to go England, so be it. So be it. You wanted to go play T20 cricket and, and get your bag, which you're well entitled to do. 
If Kavem Hodge now gets picked instead of you, so be it. Because Kavem Hodge came to Australia, gritted out an innings, did better than most of you man did the last time he went to Australia. So Kavem Hodge keeps his spot. Simple. Simple. He has to keep his spot. If you think I'm wrong, get in the comments, tell me I'm wrong. But as far as I'm concerned, he has to keep his spot now. Um, so anyways, that, that, that was Kavem. Um, and then obviously late in the evening, we had Kevin Sinclair came out on Test Match debut. I think he, again, Kevin Sinclair is us. Those who are Guyanese in this chat will um will will know this. If you're a proper Guyanese cricket fan, you you shouldn't have been surprised by anything Kevin Sinclair did today. The man can bat, um, arguably, and actually, you know what? Good job, Desi. Good job, Desi. Because to, let me give. I know sometimes I, I like I bash Desi and I, I critique some of the things that he says and he does. But Desi made a point about, I reckon it was about three, four months ago in one of the press conferences. And Desi said, Kevin Sinclair is a proper top order bat. If anything, Desi was saying that he thinks that Sinclair is um, a better bat than a bowler. Now, I think that's a bit of a stretch, but I definitely agree with him that Sinclair is good enough to bat six or seven. Um and good, I'm, I'm I'm happy for Kevin Sinclair. It's about time he got his chance. He's been there or thereabouts. I want to see how how Kevin goes with the ball, um, because I reckon he was only called into the team due to the depth that he adds with the bat. I don't think they genuinely believe that spin is going to play a significant factor in this test. Nathan Lyon hasn't really got anything going on thus far in this test, which is why, for those of you who remember the 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 review show we did or preview show we did after the first test i said i thought akeem jordan would come in because my take was in this pink ball test it's going to be the seamers that that have the success akeem jordan swings the ball early so i was like yeah akeem jordan should come in i i assume they've gone for kevin because kevin can bat that has to be to me that can be the only reason but anyways bat yes and he's shown already in this um short short innings that he's had that 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 he can bat properly so if if we're looking to day two, it's clear to me that Shamar Joseph and Kimar Roach, they should be they should be going out there with a mindset of let's occupy the crease for as long as possible because if Kevin is given enough of the ball to bat, he can add another 20 for us. He can add another 20, 25 because he has a proper batting technique. Obviously, Alzari wanted to do Dunce and Bolsi and it came off like he got 32 of 22. I hope people take this the right way. Like I'm glad for the 32 of 22. And if anybody sends this to Alzari Joseph, Alzari, I hope you take this the right way. Alzari is good enough to bat properly. Like Alzari, if there's any Antigans in this chat, they'll they'll and they're cricket fans, they'll back this up for me. Alzari, as a youngster, could bat properly. He could bat like long, proper innings. Does anyone, does anyone remember that 80 odd he made in um New Zealand? I think it was back in 2021, maybe. Can't remember. Um, and sometimes I just wonder if Alzari. Yeah, I don't really get it. I just, I just don't really get it with Alzari. Every time Alzari comes out, I'm thinking, yeah, Alzari, you're good for 20, 25 runs here. You know how to bat. And then he just starts just slashing at the ball. And today it came off. So I'm not actually being I'm not actually being critical of Alzari here. Today it came off. But don't get me wrong, it was streaky as hell. Some edges past slips, some wild hoiks. But realistically, that's not how your your test match number nine, who knows how to bat, should be batting most of the time. But you know what? It, it, it is what it is. He got the 32 runs. We give banks. 32 crucial runs. It obviously got into the Australian's head. It ensured that we kept Australia out there for the whole day. So we can't be too critical. But I just sometimes wonder with Alzari, Alzari, when are you going to go back to just batting properly? And it wasn't like he was batting with a dunce at the other end who can't bat. He was batting with Kevin Sinclair. More time when he comes in before Kevin got in the team, he'd be batting with um with Josh De Silva. And I've just felt that, Alzari, you can bat long, you know. You know how to bat long. Um... So I don't know. I, I don't know where Alzari's at with his batting. He's probably saying to himself, boy, I hit 32 runs, so I've done my job. And I hear that. But um, I'd like to see that more regularly, I guess, in a more conventional way.
but but it is what it is. So people, two six six for eight. How long have we gone on the live? Thirty five minutes. Two six six for eight. Um, let's get in the comments. What's realistic, people? What's the um? What's 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 realistic? What's realistic? Is three hundred realistic? I don't think it is, but I I think I would take. I would take 280, 285. I would take 280, 285. I think, yeah, I think lots of you are saying aim for 300. I think the Australians probably come out with a bit of fire tomorrow morning and try and just blast us out quite quick. Um, 300 in terms of just, I don't want to call 300 scoreboard pressure, but it's, normal, it's, it's more like the figure 300 means something realistically so 300 is 34 runs away we should be able to get 34 runs from uh kevin kimar and shamar joseph but this is australia we're talking about so i would probably accept 280 285 because it's australia i think the primary target should be to get to 300 anything above 300 is then a bonus i would say the other question we have to ask ourselves is this then, people. I see all your comments. Most of you are saying somewhere between the like 290, 300 ballpark, right? So here's my next question. <laughs> Listen carefully, people. Listen to this. How flat is this wicket? I think the new ball does something. But once that new ball burst goes away, how flat is this wicket? So I guess my next question is, how much do you think Australia are going to make? Because I actually think this pitch is a more flat than people realise, right? I, re <laughs> I reckon after the initial burst, this could be, I could be wrong, but my gut is telling me after what I watched today, that after this initial burst with the like, what, first 10 to 15, 20 overs or first session with the new ball, you can make hay on this track. Put it this way. If I'm Australia, if I'm Australia, I'm aiming for 450 minimum at the bare minimum. Now, don't get me wrong. Our bowlers, Shamar Joseph, Alzari Joseph, Kimar Roach, I'm not really counting Kevin because I think this is a seamer's wicket. Um, they And Justin Graves, actually. Justin Graves does get some nibble. He, he is able to get some swing, to be fair to Justin Graves. Um, our bowlers could come out and make that ball talk in the first few overs. But the problem between with Australia and us, and rightly so, because Australia world number one, is even in that last test when we bowled well, right? I don't know if anybody was like me. Those who are in the Discord group know that I'd said this in the Discord group. Even when we were bowling well, you knew that one Australian was definitely going to score a century because... You just knew that's what they do. So you can look at someone like uh, Mitch Marsh. You can look at someone like Travis Head. You can look at someone like um, Cameron Green. And you'll say to yourself, oh, yeah, once we get to them, man, we can do something. Here's a guarantee I'll give you. Someone in that Australian team is scoring a century tomorrow. Someone. It's a guarantee that one of them is getting a century. So whereas we celebrate that one of our guys got to 79, one of them Australians is getting a century. And you see, if they get a century on this wicket, they're going to push on for that century. So I don't know which one of them man's getting a century, but one of them is getting a century. I think Australia will be targeting 450. Um, and then it all becomes about whether West Indies can make Australia back again. I think it, it, I think it really boils down to that. Hold on, I saw a comment here. What's this saying? Uh, Charles E. Ferris says the pitch is quick and our bowlers can ask some serious questions of the Aussie batsmen once they bowl top of our stump or four stump. They got to just try to bowl maidens, be patient. Okay, even if I agree with that, other than Kimar Roach, who's the bowler that's gonna bowl maidens and be patient? I I respectfully, um Jamandi, I'm coming to your comment in a minute. Respectfully, um, Shamar Joseph chases wickets, and that obviously risk reward, high risk, high reward. Alzari Joseph will chase wickets. Are we really a T apart from Roach and Graves, who may bowl some nibble, scrambled seam, etc., get some swing? 
do you trust anyone to bowl on a consistent line without going for runs? I don't know. I don't know. You might have to be asking Kevin Sinclair to hold an end at times, you know. Anyways, Jamandi has this comment. Jamandi says, how is it a guarantee, Mash, when the Australians only have two hundreds in four matches in the summer? Respectfully, Jamandi, the reason why it's a guarantee is because they're playing us. Then that, and that sounds like a criticism of our team, but to me, it is what it is, right? Um, we, someone's getting a hundred against us because it's us, right? Respectfully, the, 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 the gap in quality between the two teams means one of them Australians is scoring a hundred. I could be wrong, but I'll be back here again tomorrow to just say, you see, one of them Australians just scored a hundred. Like it's, it's, it's what they do. Right. Um, so, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm glad I'll be the first to hold my hands up if I've got that wrong. But that's what I'm expecting. Yeah, I forgot about weather. So new season, same Arsenal says weather will be in place looking to rain over the next three days. Yeah, someone told me about a, cy a cyclone coming and so on and so forth. Um, let's just, you know what, let's just get to day three and worry about that when we get to day three. The advantage of us being able to take the game 90 overs today is we're allowed to consider that rain might come. And I'm I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, we shouldn't wish for rain. Listen, every West Indies test match against someone better than us, I wish for rain at some point in the match to just kind of even up the even up the playing field somewhat, right? So we've done well to allow rain to possibly play a factor. Let's see how day two goes tomorrow because we don't know how quick Australia are going to bat. Because if 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 anyone knows that rain's a possibility, it's them. So their approach will tell us what they're thinking about potential rain coming and how quickly they have to play the match um, and so on and so forth. Um, there's a couple more comments. Uh, John says, have you listened to the Johnny Graves podcast on Sky? Santoki did. I didn't. But the only reason I didn't uh, take this the right way is because most of what's come out of that podcast, like, res again, respectfully, I feel, and this is, I'm going to big up the Caribbean Cricket Podcast here, whereas the rest of the cricket world was like, oh, Johnny Grave went on the Sky Pod and said this and said that. Wow, I didn't really understand that's what's going on in West Indies cricket. When I was seeing all of the comments come out from the podcast, all I was thinking was, Johnny Gray's been on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast enough times telling people this is what goes on in West Indies cricket. I was thinking Jimmy Adams, as when he was director of cricket, he'd been on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast enough times talking about what really goes on in West Indies cricket. We've had Graham West come on talking about development. We had Chris Brabazon come on talking about um, coach education management. We've had the president, Kishore Shallow, come on and talk about the realities of cricket. We had um, uh, uh, um, Dominic come on to talk about the commercial aspects of marketing within uh, uh, Cricket West Indies and the region and the kind of things that people need to consider. So respectfully, what, Athos is great. Like, Athos is my guy. And, and NASA, big up NASA. But respectfully, I was just thinking, yeah, but we've we done been doing all this. We done been getting these guys on and trying to tell people about what's really going on in the region and what really afflicts cricket in the region. We done been telling the stories for people. That's my personal take on it. So that's why I didn't really go too, too in on it because Johnny was given that to me and given my um, uh, the relationship I have with Johnny uh, professionally, that was just Johnny telling the rest of the world. But if the rest of the world were listening to CCP, they wouldn't be surprised by anything Johnny said because we'd be done being saying this. That's far. That's me personally, anyways, in terms of um, that that podcast and what came out of it. Um, Jordan Nelson, let me take some questions before I wrap this up. Jordan Nelson says it would be interesting to analyze how the lack of cheap interregional travel stimulates West Indies cricket development. Did you see the? Um, so there's a boat service that I think it's Trinidad, Barbados, is it Guyana? Is it St. Vincent? I can't remember who are the islands involved and countries involved, but some private capitalist venturist, capitalist venture people have set up some boat that they want to go between the Eastern Caribbean islands. Um, I would never get on that boat personally, um, but that's just because I'm a seasick person. But that's I, I want to know when that boat starts. I want to know how cheap it's going to be. I really want to know how they how cheap they're going to make that. But what I will tell you about. Uh, interregional travel. I'll give you a little story here. 
when I was visiting my parents um, in Jamaica this summer, um, West Indies were playing India in uh, Port of Spain, right? And I said to my dad, right, you know what? Obviously, I'm in, I was in Jamaica for two and a half weeks. I said to my dad, you know what? Let me book a flight. I said, I'm going to go. I said, I'm going to book a flight. I'm going to go Trinidad to go watch this test match. I'll be back. You see, when I went online to see how much the flight would cost to go from Kingston um, to, to, to Trinidad, it cost it cost £600. That was the cheapest flight I could find. £600 to do a three-hour flight or three and a half, whatever it is, from Jamaica to Trinidad and Tobago. Are you insane? £600. I might as well go back home to the UK then. What the what on earth? So then I said to my dad, nah, nah, it can't be £600. Surely there's a cheaper way to get from Jamaica to Trinidad. And there was one. I, I found a flight that could get me from Jamaica to Trinidad for £450. And I nearly took it um, because I was like, yeah, I need, I want to go watch some test match. And the reason I didn't take it, £450, by the way, people, not even dollars, um, is because that, for, that one I found for £450 was I had to go to Panama. I swear it was Panama. And I had to stay in Panama for 20 hours before... The <laughs> before catching a connecting flight to Trinidad. And that was £450. And I just thought, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous to go and watch those down bad men for £600. I'm already getting up at four o'clock in the morning, but I think I draw the line at £600 to, to, to fly and go watch, uh, to go and, to go and watch um, West Indies, right? So, and that's just me. That's me, just one man. So imagine now when Cricket West Indies have to charter seven, eight, six different teams to one nation to go play a domestic championship. And, and them nations them nations have a 15-man squad. And this is before we talk about the strength and conditioning coach and the coach themselves and the assistant coach and the this man and the that man. So each contingent team, let's say when the four-day champ is in Trinidad, is taking a 20-person squad to fly to Trinidad. So... Where's that money coming from, if not from Cricket West Indies? And that's just travel. And that's within our own region. That's not even the travel to get from flying every man in the, in the region to one central hub in the Caribbean, to then fly to the United States, to then catch that 24-hour whatever flight it is from Los Angeles to Australia. Do you know how much? And remember, West Indies man travel first class. How much money must these men be spending just on travel? Before we even get into development and grassroots and women's cricket and youth man cricket um, and inter-regional tournaments. Holes, this is it's nuts. Just break that down in your head. How nuts must all of that be? So just it's pure money hemorrhage, hemorrhaging, hem hemorrhaging. Um, we're hemorrhaging pure money just on travel in the region. So that kind of gives people um, a, a, a bit of a kind of mini understanding of what of what we're dealing with here um and that's why like lots of people lots of people have said to me oh, i'm actually going to go to the world cup in june and i want to i want to be there but when i started looking at prices i was like i was like great like imagine imagine you wanted to go world cup so i think one of our first games is i think it's in guyana against uganda or papua new guinea or something so let's say i fly to uganda that's oh, Uganda. Sorry. Let's say I fly to Guyana to watch that game. Now, let's say I want to now go Trinidad to watch the other games, then fly back to Guyana and then fly St. Lucia just to watch those games. Whereas in England, if a, if a, if a World Cup is held in England, I might like. So when remember 2019, when the World Cup was here, I can stay in London and get a coach up to Nottingham, £10, £15 ticket come home 15 pound only just for me to go guyana to trinidad back to guyana to saint lucia just to watch four dega dega world cup matches i bankrupt my whole life do you see what i mean so people these other cricket nations they don't really understand they don't really understand how down bad we have it in the caribbean when it comes to regional travel it's it's, it's crazy out here you know um so yeah there's little things that they don't think about and then you will just have man saying, why are the West Indies so weak? Give us some money then. <laughs> Give us some money. Um, so anyways, people, listen, 
Um, yeah, do you know what, Errol? Um, <laughs> Errol says, why is international travel so expensive? These airlines must not make any money from regional services. Do you know what? What, what I need to do, Errol, is I need to get someone on. I'm going to, I think, let me do, let me do a different um, podcast episode. Let me try find someone from Caribbean Airlines to come on, to try and come on the show and explain themselves to the, to the region and explain why they're ripping off, ripping us off so badly um, to travel around the region and what can they do to make it a better experience for us, um, you know? Uh, yeah. So people, 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 um, what's the time? 50 minutes. I said this was only going to be 25 minutes. See, look what you lot have done. It's 20, it's 20 to 11. Um, the, the, the second day starts in five hours. I need to get some sleep before I wake up for that. Um, people, thank you, by the way. I didn't even realize 404. At one point I thought, I think there was like 470 people concurrently in the live. So big up anybody, wherever you've, wherever you're listening to this from, uh, I don't know if you're from Australia. Um, maybe there's some Antipodeans in, in this chat right now, because I, is it morning time? Is it early morning in the, in Australia? Yeah, I don't even know. Um, so I don't know where you are all listening from, uh, but big up whoever's listening. UK man, obviously it's late in the evening for us. Caribbean, it's early, early evening. Um, but yeah, I'll try to get someone. I'll try to get someone on to talk about travel in the region uh, from the actual tourism sector or travel sector and see what we can do. Uh, big up everybody who came through. If you've come through, it's almost 10 o'clock in Australia. Can't be. No way, because then the test match will have started. Um, yeah, big up everybody who came through. Obviously, some there's somebody in here who has put um somebody in the chat wanted the link for the Discord. I think there's a couple of Discord guys. Yeah, so Jordan said, Jordan says, where's the Discord link? There's a couple of Discord guys um in this chat right now, so they can probably put the link in for you. Um, if they, if they don't put the link in, private message me. Um, oh, yes, a day-night test. So, so, of course, it is in the morning in Australia, New Zealand. Sorry, people, I was thinking, sorry, got it completely wrong. Of course, it's morning time in Australia and New Zealand. So, um, yeah, anyone who wants that link, private message me on Twitter, and I can send it that way um, as well if you want that. Um, and then last comment, I'll just pick another comment here. Uh, where is it? I just want to, somebody asked me something here. Let me just find it. Uh, where is it? It's about Jewel Andrew. Can't even find ah, Jewel Andrew. So, uh, Anne Beer says, Jewel Andrew, any comments? So, obviously, West Indies under 19. So, we the joke is so West Indies senior men's team is obviously playing second day against Australia. The West Indies under 19 team is playing England tomorrow as well. Obviously, that game's in South Africa. Um, what time does that game start? Anyone in the comments, when does that one start? Is that the same time as we're playing Australia? Is that a 4 a.m. start as well? Or is it a later start? I don't even know. I haven't even looked to see when that one starts. Um, <clears throat> but Jewel Andrew, so Jewel Andrew, 17-year-old, um, again, if there's any Antigans in the chat, they'll probably be able to say more about Jewel. But people have been talking about Jewel in Antigua for a long time, right? Jewel reminds me so much of how Nicholas Puran played at that age um, as well. When, when Puran first made it for West Indies under 19, Jewel has that kind of 360 ability, very similar to, and he's got that destructive kind of, I don't want to call it carefree, but no fear. No fear is what I would say about Jewel Andrew. 360 approach to the wicket. Um, now, there is a tournament in Antigua which runs every year called Cool and Smooth. Um, and it's like, uh, for those who have never really paid any attention to it, it's primarily an Antiguan tournament, but it includes overseas players. It's basically the closest thing we have to a Caribbean T20 outside of CPL, but it's primarily based in Antigua. And last year's tournament, Jewel was one of the stars of that tournament. Um, and his kind of, his growth as a player has been so exponential that in last year's four-day championship, was it the four-day champ or was it the Super 50? I can't remember which one. It might have been Super 50. But anyways, the Leeward Islands picked him at 16, which shows you just how talented he is. So everybody was talking about Jordan Johnson going into this Under-19 World Cup, and rightly so, but Jewel Andrew um, isn't far behind. And obviously, Jewel has outshone him in the tournament thus far. But if you again, for those who've kind of been watching his story, um, from afar, it's no surprise. 
Um, the worry, of course, Jewel will get Jewel will get a CPL deal this year. So when CPL happens in September, he should be getting an emerging players deal with one of the franchises. And obviously then that guarantees that he must play at least three, four, five games, whatever it might be. It'll be very interesting to see what happens next uh, with Jules' progression. Coming out of this World Cup, Jules should probably be in the West Indies academy side. But he might not be. And if he's not in that West Indies Academy side, he surely has to be in that CCC side. But if he's not picked in either, and then this is the problem again in the Caribbean, what does that say to his development? So if you are one of these under-19 players who's shining in the World Cup at the moment, if you come away from this under-19 World Cup and then you don't get an Academy pick or you don't get a CCC pick, so what are you supposed to be doing in the meantime? Who's assisting your development in the meantime? Do you see what I mean? It, it, it can't be they leave the World Cup in South Africa and then just go back home to their territories and just try, you know, try do a little thing here and there and try to get a little piece of help here and there. It's got to be far more structured than that. And I've never trusted the territories to know how to develop people outside the confines of an actual professional environment which technically should be the franchise teams, but more importantly should be a West Indies setup. And the best of that right now would be the academy for talented players like Johnson and Andrew, et cetera. But let's watch this space. Let's watch this space. Let's see what happens. Um, I know Isaiah Thorne, who took four wickets in the game against Scotland, he will be in the academy side or Guyana will pick him or whatever it might be. But not all of these under 19 guys will get a pick. So we have to watch and see what um, the franchise setups do. Um, going forward. And this is why we probably need an under-23 tournament, you know? Uh, last question, just because it's about to go. Jason Humphrey says, two questions. Should Chandapur bat at number four and put somebody else to open? Uh, da, 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 da. I'm not sure about that. Chandapur's opened all of his life. Um, why do you want him at number four? What sells... What, What's the benefit? Is it because you don't trust him facing the new ball? Listen, Shiv, Shiv, I'm saying Shiv, Tej has batted like this his whole career from under 19 days to now. That, that, that ain't changing anytime soon. That he is what he, he is, what he is right? Um, so no is the answer to bat number four. Should Holder and company be back in the test team for England? Jason will get back in. 100% Jason will get back in. The question mark is who else comes into the side? And how many of this current lot keep their spot? Um, Jason is the only one who I think walks straight back in to the side. Um, can't think of. I don't know. You would. I don't know about Shea Hope. I don't know about Brandon King. You'd think they'd be in the conversation somewhere. But you know, what? I'm gonna go. But I'm just gonna throw this one name out there, people, before I go, because I was thinking about this the other day. Do you know who I, would, who I would select for the West Indies test side? Don't laugh. Don't laugh. I'm just going to drop the name and then remind me that I drop this name in future episodes. I would pick Romario Shepard for West Indies test side. Why has Romario Shepard not played a test match? It's weird. Well, think about it for a second. Why has he not played a test match? How, how has he got to the age? Well, I, I know why because of West Indies cricket. But how has he got to the age of 28, 27 and he's not played not one test match for the West Indies? It don't make no sense. When you think about it, it don't make no sense. And he can bat, you know. Anyways, let me not... That's a, Listen, that's another conversation for another day. Let me not get into that one too, too tough. Um, because we could, have, we, we could have that conversation. Let me, just, let me leave that one. Um, so, uh, there was a super chat. So, I didn't want to ignore it. Thank you, Frank, uh, for the super chat. I saw it, but I was in the midst of responding to someone else. So, much appreciated, man. Um, thank you for that. Listen, people, you can probably, you can probably hear it in my voice. Voice is tired out here, and I'm, I need to go catch at least four and a half hours sleep before I wake up for day two of the test match. So, listen, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming through on the live. You lot said it'd go an hour. It has gone an hour. We've got 30 seconds to get rid of this before it goes over an hour. Thank you for coming through on the live. Much appreciated, everyone. We'll be back for day two roundup um, as well. Uh, hopefully, people got the Discord link. Um, if not, just message me on Twitter, and I'll get it through to you um, in time. Thank you to the current 466 of you, which who are currently still in this live. And on the way out, like, share, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram. Um, 
And if you don't, sorry, last plug, last plug. I recorded an interview. Um, so I have another podcast. I don't know how many of you know. It's called The Game is the Game. Um, it's my own personal one that I do. I, you, some of you will be like, Mash, why are you plugging your own thing? I'm plugging it, yes. Um, but anyways, I did an interview on that podcast um, with Alex Jordan. Uh, Alex Jordan, most of you will know her through um, CPL. Um, the Alex Jordan, if you're Bayesian, you'll know her from, uh, well, from you should just know her if you're Bayesian. Um, Alex Jordan, Morning Show, etc. People may remember her from Sports Mats, etc. So I recorded an episode with Alex Jordan and I thought it was really good. So if anybody wants to, to listen uh, to that episode, I put the Spotify link um, in the chat. So if you want to go listen to that, um, it's really cool. It's a really cool interview with Alex. And we talk about cricket quite a bit in that as well. So if you want some listening content to pass the day by, go check that out. The game is the game. Uh, type in Spotify, but the link's there. Catch you lot soon. Like, share, subscribe on the way out. And uh, yeah, I've been Mashal St. Patrick here at One Half the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rule. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.